My name is Chuck Tatham. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer here at Densify. I'm joined by Andrew Hillier, one of the co-founders of the company, and our Chief Technology Officer, uh, also an expert uh, in today's topic. And today we will uh, take you through some, some interesting uh, background of an emerging challenge we're seeing in larger enterprises and their, their container and Kubernetes strategies. Uh, if you have questions uh, at any point through the webinar, you can enter them through the Q&A button uh, at the, uh, I believe it appears at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll endeavor to answer those. We do have a lot of content today. If we don't get to the questions or get through them all, uh, we will absolutely follow up. I will also note that we are recording the session so that if you choose to replay or want to share it uh, with others in your company, uh, you'll be able to do so. So uh, without further ado, Andrew, uh, over to you. Okay, thanks, Chuck. And I, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but we also have a couple of polls to keep it a little bit interactive. It should be interesting. Um, there's, there's basically three sections I'm going to cover. I want to talk a bit about our industry observations, um, do a little bit of a thought exercise on containers to kind of highlight some of the problems we're seeing, and then how to, how to fix those problems. So hopefully you'll find it interesting, and let's just dive right in. <clears throat> so the world of resource optimization, I just want to step way back and talk about the trends we're seeing as you move from virtual to cloud to containers. And what's happening is, I think most people have observed this, as a, is as you go over to the right, there's more and more things and it's more and more complex in, in, in certain ways. Um, certainly if you, if you looked at a cloud bill, you'd see a number of rows in that, you, you kind of agree that there's a lot of stuff going on and containers are even more granular um, when it comes to, you know, relative to VMs, for example, there's usually many more containers in the environment. Um, and when it comes to optimizing the, the supply and demand, the resources, in the virtual world, we see, a, a, you know, we've seen a big focus on where you put the VMs, how you allocate resources to them, Understanding that pipeline of demand that's coming into the environment so you can buy gear and put it on the floor before you need it. You know, making sure you have enough resources without having too much kind of was a, has been the focus for, you know, for forever, basically, in capacity. But in the virtual world, it was done a certain way. But when we moved to cloud, of course, there's now the introduction of, of elasticity and catalogs. So it starts to look quite different. Um, it, it really is more about choosing the right type of instance and the right size for the workload, making sure the scaling is happening properly. And it kind of introduced what we call micro-purchasing, where um, you can buy things in tiny amounts. A relatively junior person could put a line of code in a Terraform file that will buy an M4 large. And so that really changed the, the nature of the, of the uh, resource optimization and kind of distributed it across the organization. It's, not, it's much less centralized when you start to have that type of model. Um, containers shifts it again. So they, they look a little more like VMs in that um, you can kind of size them and, and place them. But, they're very granular and you need to give the um, request resources for those containers. And I'll talk quite a bit about this, um, which is again, it, it creates all kinds of interesting opportunities and challenges. There's all kinds of weird and wonderful structures. They can be grouped in pods or replica sets or deployments that needs to be taken into account. There's quotas and of course they run on nodes. So those nodes might be cloud instances or VMs or bare metal. So it kind of adds a whole new level. And, and again, I'll get into that a bit more. Um, and from a capacity resource optimization, if you look at the capacity management world, um, it evolved to be a very uh, a mature practice uh, over the years uh, in a virtual environments. But what happened was, it, from our point of view, and, and um, you know, we're doing a lot of research around this and exactly what's happening here, when cloud got introduced, people tended to take their eye off the ball in terms of capacity and focus on the bill. So it was less about the resources, more about the costs. And, and you know, that was an evolution that the industry went through. And we believe it's going to circle back uh, and there needs to be a reintroduction of some of that capacity discipline, but it'll probably look different than it did in the past. It's not necessarily the same thing that was being done in capacity management, but it's for the same purpose, to make sure you have enough without having too much. And that's a very useful way to view this because as you move to the, to the right, having enough and not having too much, um, it, it's not necessarily being done uh, in, in container environments, at least in the in this stage of the evolution. So that's kind of our, our, our overall view of what's happening. And, and our view uh, at Densify is that there really needs to be a lot of automation, especially as you move to the right. You can't do these things manually. Um, you can't continue to do things manually if you are. In a container world, humans shouldn't be touching these things. There's too many of them. They're moving too quickly. Um, you know, we've even seen spelling mistakes in the Terraform files if, if people So it needs to be a level of automation. And that's supported by, um, you know, the FinOps Foundation does a lot of surveys. And, you know, one of the interesting ones they had is that 
they need more automation. Um, there's a lot of organizations without much automation, or maybe they're automating uh, uh, notifications to teams, which is very useful. But you see that purple one, automated right sizing. There's not enough of that happening. If people are still doing that manually, um, these people will become overwhelmed as containers deploy in more and more scale. So um, it's our view. I think it's a, it's not a really controversial view that that automation is is um, is kind of the, the direction, certainly in the container world. Now, if we talk about cost for a second, because when you do don't get the resources right, when you do it incorrectly, it usually ultimately turns out to be a cost problem. It looks like a, a big bill for some reason. And if you look at the way the industry views certainly cloud cost um, and tries to tackle this problem, there's been a big focus on the top part of this pyramid, you know, how you're buying, what the bill is, but not a lot of focus on what you're buying, the, the resources themselves. So there's a whole slew of products out there that will take your bill and slice and dice it and say who's spending what, maybe look for unusual things happening. And a lot of organizations uh, use that to, to buy discounts. Um, and so, and that makes sense because that's, that's within the realm of control of finance people to say, okay, I'm just gonna prepay for that and get a lower bill. And that makes complete sense. But what it doesn't do is actually change what you're actually using. It just kind of gets a better bill. Of, it's, it's, like, it's like getting a discount on your, on your gas card instead of actually burning less gas. And so if you go below this line, there's a whole series of things that in our view have a bigger impact on cost. Um, optimizing cloud instance types, sizes, families, Container optimization, of course, the topic today, um, and then going out and actually making changes to the environment to make to make things better, and possibly doing that then through a pipeline so it's happening automatically. Um, and we we view those sets of operations more on the resource optimization as having a much bigger impact and an additive impact to the top part of this pyramid, but it hasn't been done initially because it does involve more technical, involves engineers, app owners to make these changes. You can't a finance team can't go and resize a container. Um, it's quite far out of their control. So that's kind of our view of, of you know, the, the cost problem can be broken down into how you're buying and what you're buying. And, you know, we have a huge focus on the what you're buying. And it, we think that's kind of the evolution and highly related to that capacity operations. And the, the, the direct relationship is um, because we're not sure it's actually being done right now in a lot of organizations. So when we talk to organizations, um, there's usually an emerging FinOps team, um, you know, very useful practice. That, you know, if you look at the FinOps Foundation mandate is cloud financial management, it's pretty, pretty simple. So all that stuff at the top clearly falls under FinOps. At the bottom, uh, that certainly that bottom part falls under DevOps and the mandate of DevOps is typically to deliver applications and services quickly, um, agility, focus on functionality, get that, you know, that new app out and running. But neither of these disciplines have focused on going out and optimizing what's there. So in a DevOps process, you might get you know, values for requests and limits in your containers. But a month later, is anybody going out and actually optimizing them based on what's actually happening? We don't see that happening. Um, I, you know, it, it is a highly related to both these disciplines, but in practice, you know, FinOps folks, they're, they're busy and they don't necessarily have the expertise to go and, and dig into it at this level. And DevOps is focused on delivering apps. So we've seen this gap form where the ongoing optimization of these environments um, isn't really happening. And that led us to kind of start talking about capacity operations and, and kind of coin the phrase cap ops. It's kind of taking capacity, which is traditionally more of an offline discipline and ops and you know, bringing it online. And we think this nicely captures what needs to happen here, uh, where there's a continuous uh, 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 discipline to optimize all the resources. Some of our customers call it capacity 2.0. I mean, there's different ways to view this depending on your point of view. But we think this is a gap that's emerged that, that needs to be addressed. And because the existing roles, FinOps, DevOps, um, capacity management, um, if it is happening, we don't see it consistently happening in, in one group or the other. It's kind of um, all over the place in, from what we're seeing. And that leads to our first polling question, which um, Danielle is gonna administer. Um, I'm not sure if there, there we go. So to that very thing I just mentioned, what's your view on uh, who's responsible for optimizing the resources. I, I'd like you to answer not, not necessarily the first time something goes out, but on an ongoing basis. Think of this as on an ongoing basis, um, who is responsible for making sure things are, are correct from a, a capacity and resource perspective? We're seeing correct, Andrew. You just finished a customer sort of mini summit in the last week. Um, we, while we are seeing some patterns, it's, it's still highly variable. 
Yeah, absolutely. Regard, and and, yeah. and it's, it's variable. And the one thing I'm seeing is that it also is different if your containers are are on-prem versus in the cloud. Because right. in the on-prem world, it may be a continuity with the capacity teams that exist. In the cloud, oftentimes we see it's completely different teams and, and they're not necessarily uh, related to the, the, the other capacity teams that might be doing, for example, VMware environments. So there is a, a complete mix. So the, the, uh, if we uh, share the results there, it's, it's interesting. <clears throat> um, you know, we do see uh, a, fair, a fair number of nobody, uh, although the, the number is low in this, in this uh, cohort. Um, DevOps and the development process is, I think, where we would say we see the most decisioning going on on an individual basis. Uh, and then the emergence of more formal or the return of more formal capacity uh, control, uh, as you say, probably different, whether it's an on-prem, you know, extension of virtual infrastructure or, or cloud. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think this is, you know, this is interesting and I think it's consistent with our view. We'll show some slides a bit later where DevOps is definitely a logical place for this to occur because that's where the values need to go in the Terraform files to make this happen. And we'll talk about that. Um, but whether DevOps teams has the tooling and analytics to do that is another question, or whether that's a different function or team providing those numbers. So an interesting, uh, interesting comment um, by an attendee, uh, responsible or accountable DevOps teams have both the control, uh, have both, but the control compliance is done, um, you know, by a cost ops uh, yep. function, interesting. And that makes a lot of sense. So it's not so again, DevOps is a place where the numbers need to inject into the into the pipeline. They may not be the ones responsible for those numbers or and again, mm -hmm. this is this is wide open. We're not necessarily even prescribing anything here. We're we're just observing the evolution of this and seeing where, yeah. where it's going. But it, wherever they go, this our view is that this needs to to happen. Thanks for thanks for the input, people. Uh, yep. Andrew, let's uh, continue on forward. All right. So let's talk about containers more specifically. Um, and the challenge we see. And so let's, I'm just gonna bring up this slide and spend the next half hour discussing every box on it. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not gonna do that. It's a, it's a very detailed slide on purpose because it's just intended to show the, the complexity. All of this kind of layers on top of what's already running. So the boxes across the bottom, the nodes, you know, they could be your VMs or your cloud instances. And then everything else on this is kind of new. <laughs> it all layers on top of it. And so we've got the, the nodes and the, the control plane. We have uh, across the top, the actual workload. And in the middle, there's a bunch of uh, overlays, uh, uh, namespaces, projects, quotas, all of which tend to make this a fairly complex uh, uh, equation. And I'll go through this in some detail, but at a high level, um, what we see is that the, the, the challenge you see out there is that just understanding all the moving parts is a challenge in itself. And you, know, you can bring a Grafana chart up on a container, but you might have 10,000 containers and that, that container might already be gone. So how do you actually even make sense of what's happening here and get visibility? So visibility is important. Um, I'll focus a lot on this top part um, for app owners or somebody to determine what resources they need. Um, we see this as, as a challenge and then it has a lot of knock-on effects because if that's wrong, then your infrastructure is probably wrong. Uh, the nodes need to provide the resources for the containers to run on um, and so, they're all kind of interrelated. And then of course, what you're buying depends on all of those things. And so if you're, you know, you're forecasting, if you're on-prem or you're buying, you know, savings plans in the cloud, all of that is predicated on kind of understanding what you're going to need, which is probably not possible if you're using the wrong stuff, if everything's wrong to begin with, you're just extrapolating off a bad number. So, um, and, and what I wanted to do was go through that, you know, that top part of the diagram and talk about that a little bit more and, and draw an analogy. So, and, and how containers are different than VMs. So a VM is kind of like, I consider it kind of like my laptop. Uh, I'm sitting at a laptop right now. It's actually a lot like that one in the picture. And, you know, I kind of understand what it is and it's a quad core with 16 gig. And I kind of know that if I went down to eight gig, my SQL server wouldn't work so well and all that kind of stuff. So it's a known quantity, much like the VM, you know, VMs where I got a two by eight or a four by 16. And I kind of know um, a bunch of stuff is running in it in my VM and I've got my head wrapped around it. And it might be incorrect or bigger or smaller, but it's kind of the unit I'm thinking in. Um, if you look at containers, they're not like that at all. They're more like the processes running on my laptop. So this is the set of things that were at the time I made the slide running on my laptop. And I've got four copies of PowerPoint running and Outlook and Chrome. Um, and so this is more 
what a container is like. A container is more at, like at the process level. You can make a container have a lot of stuff in it, but basically um, it's, it's intended to be more granular. And so I might end up running PowerPoint in a container if, if one were to do so. And there's all these comm circuits that are running on my laptop. They're kind of like replica sets. There are things that kind of come and go and replicate out as the load mandates. So there's a lot of things that kind of demons and things that come and go. And so, you know, this kind of, so if I was going to put this in a container, then it begs the question, well, how many millicores do I need to give PowerPoint? And the answer is, I have no idea. I always like to joke that I know I use PowerPoint every day and I've been in this industry for a long time and I would have no clue how many, how many millicores to assign to PowerPoint to make it work properly. But that's kind of what you have to do. Um, if you're going to run PowerPoint in a container, um, you've got to give it some request and limit numbers so that that, that makes sense. And if I don't give them, I've got a world of hurt. If I give them and they're too high, I'll talk about that problem. If they're too low, different problem. They, they, there's all kinds of repercussions of doing this wrong. And that we see that as a, as a fairly big emerging problem. And I'll talk about what, what, what uh, the impact of that problem. So let's take this laptop analogy and kind of run with it. Let's say that these worker nodes are actually a bunch of laptops. And I'm going to go through uh, what I need to run on those laptops and try and figure out what I need to give them. So, and again, this is just a, a, a it's, it's, it's kind of a, a thought exercise. It's, it's, it's half joking, it's half real because this is probably exactly what happens. So PowerPoint is very important to me. I'm, I'm giving a webcast right now. I do not want it to slow down or, or my transitions to be all jerky. So I'd say, maybe I want to give it a couple of CPUs. It, it, it can use a bunch of resources. Maybe I'll give it a thousand millicores, but it, you know, just take these numbers with a grain of salt. But the thought process is, is a lot like this. I've got, let's say I have a, a pod that has three containers in it. And maybe it's my office pod that has Outlook and Word and Excel. And I need to give them some resources. And you know, Excel Excel's a good example. I don't always run Excel, but when I do, I use really big spreadsheets. They tend to have like 35,000 lines. So I'm gonna give it some, some horsepower. Uh, Zoom, I'm on it now, live video. Ooh, let's give that um, four, you know, four CPUs. Skype, Teams, um, web servers. At the time I did this exercise, I had 17 instances of Chrome running on my laptop. Let's just say I give them a half a, a dig each. Um, and again, these numbers could be higher or lower. What I'm trying to exercise, you know, maybe my SQL server, I give it two, uh, two CPUs. If I do this, um, just, you know, kind of trying to be safe. Uh, maybe I'm being too safe, which is exactly what app owners do. They, they've got their apps. They want them to run property. That's kind of their mandate is to make sure that the apps run properly. I end up with 28 CPU, over 28 CPUs worth of capacity for what's running on my laptop right now. Uh, and that's just if I tried to give a rational view of what these things need. The trick here is that I know I'm not running them all at once, but when I give them, when I give them values, I'm thinking about when they are running what they need. Um, so, but the truth is on my laptop, I'm not using all of these things simultaneously. Um, so that leads to this kind of uh, rather perverse thing where uh, if I need 28, 0.5 CPUs. Well, in a virtual environment, if I had a box that had four physical C or four cores, we'll say, I can overcommit. I can give an eight to one overcommit, which gives me 32 virtual CPUs. And so all of that stuff can run on my laptop again, which kind of is intuitive because um, it's already running on my laptop. But the overcommit lets me give the same resources out to multiple workloads, knowing that they're not all going to use them at the same time. That's kind of one of the premises of overcommit in, in a virtual environment. In a container environment, and I want to stress this very, very carefully, they aren't virtual resources. These aren't virtual millicores I'm giving out. They are millicores. If I give PowerPoint 2,000 millicores, it gets two CPUs. And when Kubernetes is scheduling the resources out, it won't run Outlook on a node if there aren't, if there aren't enough resources to, to guarantee two CPUs. So in this example, it's going to actually run it on eight laptops because it's as it schedule these workloads around Robins, it's going to not be able to put things because it's all the requests, all the all the values are requested out on the laptop, even though they're not necessarily being used. So I'm going to end up with eight laptops, each at one eighth of the utilization, you know, on average. So this the point I want to stress here is that as we as we work with customers and in the industry and look at this more and more, we're realizing that this lack of virtual resources actually has a pretty big impact because they are traditionally the way that you give resources to an app team based on what they need, but you also have a mechanism to give the same resources to other app application owners or teams. So they're kind of like that, that, that um, magic that you have in the, in the um, centralized, you know, hosting environment 
to make sure there's efficiency that you can kind of give the same resource out to everybody and you know everybody got kind of comfortable with that as virtualization evolved well that's not actually the way the containers work so to put this in in pure container terms um if i have a you know kubernetes of course is what what the, kind of the world is is moving towards if it's scheduling workloads onto a bunch of either cloud instances or vms it doesn't really matter what they are um you know i'm going to get let's say i'm running a mysql here i've got to give it these numbers so forget powerpoint let's talk about an actual thing that's probably going to run in a in a container um and again i have that same challenge i don't know what to put here i'm probably going to be conservative even if i if i'm wildly uh, you know diligent about this i'm going to size it to peak and what happens is then these containers will be deployed and if the tetris block picture that is like the utilization the actual resource utilization it kind of goes up and down the dotted line is the request values so i'm requesting cpus and memory and there's inevitably going to be kind of more i'm requesting more than i actually need when, when we've analyzed many many environments and this is what we see um, where there's a kind of a bubble around these things where it's a very conservative request and the result of that is that this is an actual environment is if i look at a running kubernetes cluster the resources are all being given out to the to the pods and containers so we're seeing about 80 90 percent deployment of the resources these are the request values being fulfilled so I'm, I've, I've given out all the resources but they're not being used this environment is on average seven percent utilized um every environment we've seen looks like this we, you know we, we did a customer event challenging our customers saying does anybody have an environment that doesn't look like this and then you know nobody nobody raised their hand um and again, I trace it back to the fact that that we're not over committing here. We're giving out real CPUs, real memory, um, and in the process, we're straining a ton of capacity. So this is the pattern we're seeing. And again, I, the, the the purpose of this is 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 twofold. The section is that I want to stress that again, they're not virtual resources. So the magic is not magical. These things don't magically start, you know, creating high density container environments. The scheduler can only do what you've asked it to do, and garbage in, garbage out. You give the wrong request values, then it's going to look like this. If the request values are too low, then you get out of memory killer happening. If you if the request values aren't set, you get another problem. So these are all these numbers now, there's, there's all these little grander numbers that need to be set and need to be set correctly. Um, and we're thinking we're just at the beginning of, of, of people realizing this because um, I think only organizations are now getting to the scale where they're realizing that the cluster isn't working properly. And, and you know, one of the first questions we think people ask is, is the scheduler working properly? Yes, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The problem is is the is the values. So, with that, we're going to pause again for a second and do a, another poll. We need some Jeopardy music to play while we uh, while we do this. Um, <laughs> but the question is, um, if you know, uh, are your environments well utilized? Um, and again, I think a lot of everybody on this call, and probably not everybody, you know, these days has a, a big enough container environment to know for sure. Um, if you do know, uh, then let us know. Um, so, but again, I have no idea is a pretty valid answer here because, uh, we also see development environments that are hard to kind of, they're, they're not representative. So we see a lot of people with developed environments that are pretty big, but not indicative. I think you saw on that, on that customer conference recently, uh, a fairly consistent, uh, reaction to the question. Uh, yeah. Correct. Yeah. It was, it was a lot like what we're seeing here. I'm not sure. Can everybody see the actual results as they're coming in right now? Um, but it's, it's, it's like this, it's either, nope, we look, uh, almost everybody was like, nope, we look just like that. That could be us. Uh, uh, or they don't have enough. Mo most of our uh, customers had enough to know. Um, and it looks like maybe the attendees here, a lot of people are, are, are maybe not as far along in the container journey. Um, so they may not know, but this is kind of that, that, that split. The, the point here is that nobody's saying they have a well-utilized container environment. Um, when I was observing the other day that if you think in terms of things like VMware and traditional virtualization, uh, it's logic. Uh, it's easy to think about containers and Kubernetes in the same way, and it, and you can't because it, it's just it's the resources are dealt with completely differently. Yep, and it's uh, and I think that's that's it's an important point that that virtual resource thing became the language that 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 hosting team infrastructure groups used to talk to the consumers. And that's the that's the unit of what was given out, and that's gone. And so there needs to be, um, you know, a bit of a rethink, a bit of a rethink here. And and interestingly, uh, again, the way this you see this, the way you might first see this is that on your cloud bill, there's a high, for example, on Amazon, there's a high cost for EC2 instances, which is kind of very indirect. So because these containers run on 
EC2 instances in scale groups and they show up on the bill as EC2 instances. So all of a sudden somebody's saying, wow, I got a really big bill for EC2 instances. That traces back through multiple steps to being the container size wrong. Um, and so it's hard to recognize this is happening, um, but we see people when they do kind of tune into this, they look at their utilization, uh, they look at their, their bill, they kind of connect the dots and say, wait a minute, this is because um, we have a big upstream problem in our, in our pipeline. Okay, so thanks for the, 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 the feedback on that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try and leave a bit of time at the end for questions and comments. So if anybody wants to give any further um, insight or commentary, you're, you're welcome to. Um, let's talk about fixing this. Uh, I'll try and just talk about this for about 10 minutes or so. So the way we view it is there's kind of three intersecting worlds here. We've got the containers, the red circle. We've got the nodes that they're running on. We'll talk about, you know, in the cloud, that would be cloud instances, scale groups. They could also be VMs on-prem. And then there's the cost side of the equation. And these are all very interrelated. So, so if you want to come up with the right numbers, let's just talk about the, the numbers here. Um, you, you kind of need to look at all three because um, if, if your containers are, if I mentioned it earlier, if your containers are wrong, if you give them all way too much CPU, then you're going to end up running on nodes that have a lot of CPU just to be able to support the request values. And so the nodes are probably the wrong types. We see this all the time where when you optimize the containers, the nodes actually should be something different. They should be memory optimized or, or something else. If your nodes are the wrong types, then all your forecasts are gonna be wrong. Uh, we see people trying to double down and buy RIs or savings plans based on what they're currently using, which if that's not what you should be using, you're gonna be doubling down on the wrong thing. So the, any commitment level and financial, uh, uh, especially with RIs, you know, you're gonna be buying the wrong things. And then if you're interested in chargeback on the containers, you can't just look at the bill because to be able to attribute it to the right consumers, there's quotas, there's all kinds of other things that mean one business group might be hogging all the resources, even though they're not necessarily used, and they're responsible for a lot of the costs. So all of these things are interrelated. And if you want to come up with the right answer, in our view, it kind of sits at the intersection of these things. Um, you need to be aware of the green circle and you need to basically generate answers to optimize the red and the blue circles to, to, cut, to kind of fix this problem we're talking about. And from our perspective, that's what we, that's what we do. Of course, as a vendor, we, we, um, we are analytics that is, is um, you know, for capacity operations um, that takes in a whole bunch of detailed data. We get all the patterns of activity of all the instances, all the scale groups, all the containers and the pods, all the manifested entities. So we look at the demands and we look at the supply. And, and so in great detail. So what is it currently running on? Is it an M4 large or a T3 or is it an on-prem VM on a DL380? Whatever it is, we look at the, how much that thing costs. We look at the benchmarks of how fast it is, technical rules. It's running on an instance that has uh, local storage. So I don't want to move it to an instance that doesn't have local storage. So there's a lot of detail in the supply side across all the different hosting uh, models. Um, and then we also look at the, the bill. So not just the list price, but what the discounted amount is that you're paying for all the, the resources, the business tags, who owns it, um, you know, what, what is it part of, what app is it part of if, if they're set. And there's a very detailed policy model that says, how do I take all of this to align supply and demand? Um, and I'm not gonna get into the, the, all the details of the analytics, uh, but what it does is it kind of factors in all of these things at once to say, okay, that workload is running on a, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, an M3. Uh, I can't move it off the M3 because it's 32 bit. Okay, this other one's running on an M4. Let's move it to an M5 based system, but make it smaller or an R4, or let's take that container and make it twice the size or half the size. All of these things are outputs of this equation, but it, it requires a fairly detailed equation to get correct. And the thing I want to stress about this is that correctness is important because if I want to actually take an action, it has to be correct. I can't say, yeah, maybe it should get more CPU because you've got 10,000 of these things and no humans have enough time to go through and say, well, maybe it should have much CPU. Let me look at that for an afternoon and figure out how much CPU it needs. We, we, that can't happen. It's got to say, no, it needs exactly 350 millicores because here's the analytics that says that. Um, and so I want to stress that, that the, getting the right answer, we've seen customers using products that are kind of more cloud bill focused that generate very vague recommendations. And then they say, you know, we've got a database full of recommendations we can't take because they're not accurate enough. So we have to review them all one by one and there's not enough hours in the day to do that. So um, 
generating accurate recommendations is important. Um, let me just bring this whole slide up. In a cloud world, in the, you know, the, in the red circle, that means the requests, the limits, um, those answers should be uh, uh, then automated, done through pods and deployments, because those are the way the manifests. When I deploy something, I, I deploy a pod, which might have multiple containers. So that's where I need to fix it, is at the pod de uh, re uh, definition. Um, there's namespaces, there's quotas. Initial values is a big problem. I'm running something new, what do I set it to? These are all the things that we see being required for containers to fix them. And then once you've done that, then the blue circle, you need to optimize that. I mean, you might need to optimize it right from the start as well. But once, if I change the containers, it certainly changes the blue circle. So the nodes I'm running on, are they right? Do I need to make them bigger or smaller or something newer? Is there a new, you know, M6 out that I can use? Or should it not even be on an M? Should it be on a memory optimized instance? Um, scaling parameters. So there's a whole bunch of supply side optimization that needs to go hand in hand with the red circle. And then of course, on the bill side, you know, uh, what does it cost? Is it, is, you know, buying RIs, buying savings plans are all very important. That's something that might be done by the FinOps team. Uh, we're not saying that necessarily needs to be an output of this process, but it has to be an input to this process. So to come up with the right answers on the right side of this diagram, I do need to be aware of the left. Andrew, a, a related question from the audience on whether this responsibility really falls under FinOps or is it distinct? Well, I, I, again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. I, I view it as distinct just because it, it, for FinOp to do this, it takes them into a technical realm that they don't really need to be in other than this purpose. The financial side is big enough to manage on its own and, and the cost is important. And what we're talking about here definitely impacts the cost and, and, and reduces the cost. But I see it back to the earlier thing. I see it being more uh, of a, a, an adjunct or something that sits between it and DevOps. It's probably, if we go by history, it's probably a capacity team, maybe a capacity operations team might be under one of those teams, but it's it's specialized with subject matter experts on this. And part of it goes to FinOps, part of it goes to DevOps. Um, you, know, you could theoretically tuck it under either of those functions, but it does take the FinOps team into a very technical direction um, it, that has to, is totally intertwined with the technical operation, especially in the blue circle. It's intertwined with the way the clusters, container clusters and scale groups are operating. Um, and, it, it, and it's not that finance isn't, uh, you know, full of smart people, but they, they are not where uh, app owners would generally look for uh, infrastructure decision making either, right? So there's a, there's a credibility and or uh, just a domain knowledge that people would expect to be in the mix. Yeah, and, and we see one customer, a very large customer, that's kind of building a, a, a observability framework with data lakes, where this information goes into a data lake along with a lot of other information to be consumed by whomever needs it. And that makes a lot of sense because it's a very specialized operation. And like I said, especially that blue circle, you're getting it, you're, you're, you're touching on tuning the scaling parameters of a scale group to make sure you're, you're, you're warming up fast enough and things like that. And so that's getting pretty far away from the core financial, uh, you know, but it also may not be something that the DevOps team, it's, 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 it's under the control of the DevOps team, but it may not be their responsibility. So uh, it's a great question. And, and again, I think, this, how this plays out, who knows, but um, there's a lot of already existing capacity teams out there that aren't necessarily involved in you know, the cloud side. And, and one path is maybe they should be involved because they have the expertise in this area. There are already people that have the expertise, but a lot of times they're not necessarily in the loop on the cloud side, for sure. So, so some more commentary from the, the group. Uh, someone suggesting an acronym COST a cloud optimization service technology or team, um, and that it's important to provide a service desk capability to both FinOps and DevOps teams. I assume they mean uh, the, the tracking of uh, recommendations um, or, or perhaps a central, and we've seen this, uh, a central service bureau around the discipline of capacity. Uh, so the, those are those are yep, uh, that's that's an interesting thought. It makes a lot of sense it's having it a service to both, and and that's a, an interesting acronym for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and also one of the things I'm not going to talk about here is that even all of this being in a time series database that's accessible to everybody else is something that we're doing a lot of R and D on. Uh, say, is there a resource management database or a capacity operations database? Something that then it's it's highly aligned with the, the, the thought of a centralized team mm -hmm. with a centralized system of record that everybody draws from. Um, because it is a fairly specialized function. And again, unfortunately, it's a function that was kind of dropped uh, in a lot of organizations. 
we have some customers where it wasn't dropped in part, but it was dropped. In, you know, the on-prem people still, the capacity team is still involved. The cloud, they're not. And so, whatever, however it plays out, there, there needs to be this discipline reintroduced. Um, so, just watching the clock, I just, I'll go through a few more slides very quickly. Um, this is on. This is the cloud version. Uh, on-prem, it looks different. The, the red is very, very similar. It's identical, but the blue and green change because now I'm talking about VMs or even bare metal. And I'm talking about buying them far ahead. So it looks more like a traditional capacity management operation function um, where I'm forecasting and making sure I have gear on the floor as opposed to cloud where I, it, it's much more elastic, but I still need to have it programmed correctly to be, to be, to be flexing properly. So on-prem looks different than cloud, but it still has these three components. Um, they just behave differently. And I mentioned that you know the, the the automation. So our view back to that very first slide about automation is that if you do this correctly, um, uh, it should just be done as code. And we have a Terraform module, for example, that you can think of it like embedding the analytics in your Terraform. So if I had Terraform that had, and we see this a lot, hard coded, you know, millicores and megabytes, um, that can be that can be toasted. Just make it reference the analytics. Use the machine learning to say. Just make this thing whatever the analysis says it should be. And, and, and we see, I'll talk about a customer example in a second doing this. This makes a lot of sense. People aren't really attached to these numbers. They just want them to be correct and they want their services to run properly. So we call that optimization as code. Um, that lets you slipstream this into the tool chain. But very importantly, it'll never happen if the app owner doesn't want it to happen. So it needs to be communicated. It may need approval, it may not. Um, may, you know, we have customers putting things through Slack channels saying you subscribe to your service. Hey, we're recommending that thing be bigger or smaller, or we've observed this. And maybe you need to approve it, or maybe it just happens automatically. But the idea is if you work in all these things, we call the CI CD CO, and the CO is continuous optimization. So it's going through the pipeline, uh, but it's optimizing continuously as things go out. And it really is enabled by having the right answer communicated to the right people. So they give a thumbs up that I'm okay with you messing with my app and then integrated into the right system so it happens automatically. And so we see this, you know, with that five-year thing of this has to be automated, this or something like this in our view needs to exist uh, to, to make that happen. Um, and just quickly, you know, what that looks like in practice, this is our, our container optimization UI. This is a drill down into a very detailed level where you can see these are all pods and deployments and we've got a bunch of different recommendations, resizing, some things don't have a size set, so you need to set it. Some of them are too big, some of them are too small. Um, we see all kinds of weird and wonderful combinations when you run this against an actual environment. And if we pick on one of these systems, um, it, we're seeing a resize. And what a resize means, it's both up and down. Uh, and let me just explain that. So if I zoom in on the CPU, that's a 24-hour profile of what this thing is doing. And we do all this machine learning, and we look at the, we know the busiest day, a typical day, all these different patterns. And in this case, the request value and limit value, those dotted lines are set to the same value, which is never really that a good idea. Um, so we're actually clipping at the limit and at the same time, we're over requesting for the you know, typical operation. So we're saying, um, you know, this thing, it has this peak four hours midday. Uh, well, what we're saying is, um, you know, based on that, move the limit up, move the request value down. We'll, run, we'll be able to run more workloads on the nodes and this will be safer at the same time. And, in this case, I'm not having memory, but memory is the opposite. Memory uh, needs to be bumped up. Um, so uh, you can see here that it, it, it generates a bunch of net recommendations that in this environment, you know, even using a very conservative policy shaves off 20% of the CPU requirement and 14% of the memory requirement. Um, in bigger environments, we see these numbers quite a bit higher, even again, very conservatively. Um, we think there's a lot of ground to, to kind of claw back on that based on those earlier curves I showed. But this is what it tends to look like. Um, and all of these rows generate numbers that go into the Terraform or, or go into reports, app owner reports, there's various places these go uh, to let you action them. Um, now, one example of a customer, this customer uh, is, is pretty, um, you know, kind of a, a great example of this where that, I won't go through the details of their deployment pipeline, but what they do is they analyze the, the, the production environments. And at the point where they're building a Docker image, they hit our APIs for the numbers, the requests and limits, and they basically embed them into their, uh, in this case, it's uh, OpenShift templates. Um, so it automatically goes out. So every time they redeploy, um, these things are optimized. It's just continuous optimization. 
it's beautiful because the engineers that are writing app code don't need to worry about the resources. They can focus on Java or whatever it is they're writing Go. Um, the people on the ops end of the DevOps pipeline, um, you know, they, they, they are the ones where the, that they're closer to this happening and they're facilitating this happening so that nobody really needs to spend their time during the day worrying about this. They tune the machine. They got permission to do this without approval uh, because the app teams trust it and it just runs like a well-oiled machine. So this is a great example of where we like to see things go, um, but it doesn't need to be automated to be successful. You can also do this by giving rankings and reports to the app teams and they will then go and, and, and make changes to the way they're doing things as well. We've seen customers, we have customers where that's happening and it's very successful as well. Um, but again, automation is, is kind of the, the low touch uh, place that I think we'd all like to get to. And this is a, a case study that's available on our, on our website. So just to close it off, um, if I look at this back to this diagram, um, if I look at the actual containers and what they're doing, I can come up with much better numbers usually downward, they can be upward. We see a mix with the example I showed was both up and down. Um, then when I redeploy, if you watch those dotted lines, they become more aligned with the workload. Kubernetes works well. There's nothing wrong with Kubernetes when this is happening. Kubernetes, it's just garbage in, garbage out. If you give it better numbers, Kubernetes will schedule better and it will run more workloads on each node. You run on fewer nodes, you win. Now, the next step is, well, once you've optimized, those nodes might not be correct. And again, the common one we see is that I'm on a normal node, but I can go to a memory optimized node. I can run on fewer CPUs, you know, and that probably saves another 30%. So we're correcting the containers, then we're correcting the nodes that the containers are running on. And then of course I can go and buy savings plans around whatever I think I need. And it's, it kind of is a, a cascading win. And that's kind of where I think we think things need to go. And I've kind of chewed up the whole 45 minutes. So I'll hand back to Chuck to close it off. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, as, as always, great content. Um, as I said, uh, the uh, questions that don't get answered here, because we're at the end of our, our time slot, uh, we will follow up on. Uh, we did record the, uh, the deck uh, or the presentation, and we will provide that out to, uh, to all registrants. Um, there are a couple of uh, links here. One is a very short two minute explainer about our technology. If you wanted to share that with uh, uh, anyone in your organization and then the case study that Andrew mentioned a uh, short video there as well um, uh, for your for your purposes it tells the uh, Raf Eisen, uh DevOps CICD CO story. Um, just as someone does ask a question here, Andrew, maybe you could answer it quickly. Um, what we see the hyperscalers doing um, in managing their nodes or uh, optimization slash scaling sizing. Do you, mm. do you have a perspective on that? Well, that's an interesting question because one of the things that, you know, and, and Chuck, we've been discussing this internally, interestingly enough, is that one challenge here, I think, and we'll call it a, a problem, although maybe is that, you know, the container technology emerged from Google and, and, and companies <laughs> like that that don't really look like other companies. So, so um, the fact that there's no virtual CPUs and, and you know, the fact that if you're in a big bank, that was the language you used for app teams to request record resources from central groups that are hosting them. Google doesn't really have that structure. So, so they have workloads that are more grant, Google Maps, you know, that, that runs differently than a trading application. So they, they um, this technology is, is, is of course, uh, very well suited to their use case where they probably have a lot of microservices that run hot, go away, I can request the values, they're gone. Um, they're not ebbing and flowing. If you, have, if you have an app that's running all day with varying workload um, and it's not a microservice, that's where you start to hit this problem. So I suspect part of the problem is that the hyperscalers and, and companies like Google that were, were drove the evolution of this didn't have quite the same problem that other companies might have when it comes to the interaction between app teams and central hosting teams. Um, and therefore you're missing that lever that, that evolved in the corporate world around overcommit it doesn't really have the same lever. So that might actually start to become an explanation of this where um, the technology evolved out of organizations that aren't quite the same, it, that you may not be quite the same as. And therefore, um, you know, when you're, when you're running it, your, your results vary, you know, because you're not Google. Um, so I don't think there's a problem with the container technology. In our view, it just means you need to stay on top of these numbers. It may be easier for a hyperscaler to stay on top of them because they probably have a thousand engineers dedicated to their maps application. <laughs> so, so they can stay on top of those numbers. Um, but if you have 2000 applications and a smaller team, then that's not, that's not the same. So anyway, that's another thing that we're kind of exploring as we see this evolve is that is there actually a technology gap here 
um, in, you know, it, or is it just, you know, obviously we, our view is that point analytics at it and fix it. Um, but again, I think we're going to see people realize that, that containers aren't the same as VMs. Um, they're obviously better in many ways, but they're also missing some things. All right, Andrew, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, I do welcome you to also look at the trial link. Uh, we do provide free trials for the, the technology. We connect your infrastructure and show you what our analytics say of, of the state of either your public cloud, your container infrastructure, or, or even VMware infrastructure. So thank you all for your time and uh, watch for the recording link. And um, if you have further questions, uh, the contact form on our website is a great way to reach us. Thanks all and have a great day. Thanks everyone.